right. Anybody who knows the usual format of politics in the pub, it's usually two speakers, a break, and a Q&A. But we've got an exhibition as well, because this is about the arts. So we want to honour some of Australia's best artists. Um, I bet if we do that, we're going to put their work on a giant screen. We also, for the break, we also have a musical act, a musical interlude. Buck the Busco, who is representing one of those musicians who lives, uh, average musicians who lives on an annual salary of $10,000 a year. Um, how, do they, how do they manage? If you could put anything in a 10 gallon hat, that would be great. But uh, we do have some wonderful speakers tonight. Uh, Barbara Doran, Cecilia Castro, they've been involved with Sydney College of the Arts. And um, Juanel de la uh, she had to go to South Africa. But uh, we do have her work and we will see her speak. She did speak during those moments where the students tried so hard to battle for Sydney College of the Arts survival. And uh, last but not least of our speakers, we have the delightful, but slightly ill tonight, Sarah Hanson Young, and she has some important things to say to you. Now, the reason I feel that I have a right to speak is because I am a graduate of Sydney College of the Arts. About 100 years ago. Those were the happiest days of my life. And I want to go back a little bit in history and just do a slight overview. How have we thought about the arts over the year? What has been the state of the arts um, in the past? And I, you know, I came to the conclusion that for a long time, Australia has not known what to do with the arts. From Whitlam to Fifield, ministerial portfolios for the arts have been coupled with the environment, Aborigines, assisting the Prime Minister, heritage, sport, tourism, the territories, administrative services, communications, information economy, and information technology. Wow. And justice in New South Wales. <laughs> but that's not actually <laughs> So on the one side, I reflected, it's been classified with things we consider to be in need of protection. And on the other side, with business. In 2010, the arts portfolio was isolated from both. And by the time George Brandis got hold of it, he was able to subject arts production to his personal whim, while Mitch Byfield expressed notions that there are parallels between the arts and the disability sector. Oh. Sasha Rishan from the Sydney Morning Herald also pointed out in June last year that Brandis, as arts minister, crippled the Australia Council, the National Library, the National Gallery, Screen Australia and severely restricted the operation of the ABC. But there's someone here tonight that has been doing something about the ABC. Sarah Hanson Young. She managed to get a bill passed recently that would stop any <coughs> slashing of the funding of the ABC. I'd like to. Yeah. You know, we've had Quentin Dempster here last year and we love. Our ABC. Also, that scores of arts organisations, including Asia Link, Australian Design Centre, Australian Experimental Art Foundation, Canberra Contemporary Art Space, and the Centre for Contemporary Photography, have been lost. They've lost their Australian funding. So that is really, you know, that indicates to me a state of crisis. Sasha says it, it is difficult not to come to the conclusion that the Turnbull government has abandoned the arts as a sector where it feels it will never prevail. The Liberals won the previous election lacking an arts policy and feel that they can do the same again. In addition to the impoverished conditions that Australian artists have always endured, 
the government's proposed new regulations around vet education and capping those vet loans to $10,000 when at the school where I currently lecture, a vet diploma is $18,000. And they were also wanting to limit their funding to eligible courses exclusively to those deemed to provide good work prospects. This will uh, significantly threaten the future of the arts nationwide by cutting it at that level too. So we've, we've had some problems at Sydney College of the Arts and the HE, I don't like to use acronyms, higher education sector, but also in um, the more practical VET training, or as some say, VET. So we think that this is indicative of the anti-cultural bias and philistinism of our federal government and it urgently needs to be countered. Uh, we feel the need now to come together against this rising tide of barbarism and give our young artists hope. Unlike our current government, we understand that theirs are among the future-proof careers in tomorrow's world. The arts will exist. Thanks, Sarah Hanson-Young, and welcome to the Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure. And as a relatively new um, member of uh, the artistic community, as a, as a representative and a voice um, for you uh, in Canberra, the new portfolio responsibility, I was hoping that tonight would be an opportunity for me to tell you why I think the arts are so important, and then of course throughout the evening to be able to hear um, the varied views about what we need to be focusing on, and I've heard some great um, passion tonight already, and I must say um, a number of the things, particularly Barbara that you raised, were um, really struck a chord with me. You know, from my perspective, I think arts is one of those um, such rich areas that get often gets overlooked. It isn't valued the way it should be. But why, of course, do the arts matter? It makes us smarter, it makes us brighter, it makes us happier, and the arts make us healthier. And that is the crux of it. And at the beginning of tonight, when we heard about the portfolio um, combinations uh, throughout the various iterations of different governments and, and ministers, I thought it was astonishing that arts were not listed with education <laughs> in any one of those combinations. Yes, yes. And yet, as also um, the education portfolio holder, I proudly say, we've got the two put together. And I'm very, very proud of that. I think it is um, absolutely essential to understand that the arts are not just a foundation and a building block of a cohesive community and a, and a respectful society, but it is fundamental to our broader education and lifelong learning. We need to be valuing the arts and our creative industries far more. That means through funding our artists, fair pay, you've heard a little bit about that already tonight, education in our schools and our tertiary institutions, but at a time when we continue to hear over and over again that we are in the next kind of generation of innovation, of the jobs of the future, of the changing and diverse economies, the only way we are going to be innovative is to ensure that we invest in creative industry. Science, maths, research, all of these elements excel when you include an artistic and creative bent. The research proves that over and over again. It is absolutely essential if we are to create the next big invention, if we are to transition our economy to a cleaner, greener and smarter one. But I think the thing that I find most passionate about the arts and the creative industries is that in an increasingly challenging and sadly diverse 
world, and we've heard some of that over the evening just in the last week. The election of President Trump, for example, and uh, the reaction uh, and counter reaction to some of the things that he's already done. The thing that I think is missing in this world is empathy. It is fundamental to how we relate to each other, fundamental to how we see what kind of future we want to create, and it is the essence of what keeps us a prosperous and healthy community. And yet empathy is sadly looking thinner and thinner across the globe. I believe that art is the best teacher of empathy that we have. Whether it is a child describing to their parents what they did at childcare that day, whether it is a teenager putting in paint or in words or through music the way they see the world, how they believe the world sees them, whether it is talking from culture to culture about common values, art teaches us to empathise and connect. I visited a lot of detention centres in my previous responsibilities as having the immigration portfolio. And sitting down with children in these centres, a number of them being locked in these camps for a very long time, and seeing the power of art unlock a sense of trauma, frustration, imprisonment. I went to the Nauru Detention Centre a number of years ago and all I was allowed, I wasn't allowed to take a phone or a camera or any kind of recording device, but I insisted that I could take coloured pencils and some paper. And I sat down with the children in that camp and I got them to draw for me their world. They are some of the most powerful images and stories you will ever get out of those detention camps. Through the eyes of children describing how they see the world and how they think the world sees them. They tell a powerful story to the audience, but they provide a much needed relief of trauma for the child. The power of empathy is so inherent in the arts and the creative abilities and pathways. Of course, there's also the much needed independence of our arts community. And when you have governments who undervalue and dismiss the powerful benefits that the various creative industries can bring, you also start to see a crackdown when it comes to independence. The reason we need an independent arts community is because the critical thinking that comes with that is more important than ever. In a challenging and, it seems, forever increasingly nasty world we live in, having people who are not afraid to speak, show and tell the truth is absolutely important. can do that as well as artists can. Whether it is through the visual display, the creative word, the comic relief, or the dramatic performance that shows us very real the mirror of our own communities. That is so fundamental right now. So when I see stories of cuts to art schools, or cuts to funding to arts organisations that support artists. When I see lists of courses that ministers say are important for our economy and yet creative industries have been gutted, I think we're going down the wrong path. Investing in the creative industries, in the innovation and the empathy that they bring is how we will actually get past and through the most challenging times that we that, that we're confronting with and confronted with right now. 
democracy, a healthy democracy, a safe community, a respectful community, desperately needs a thriving arts sector. And it's not just about, I want to make, I want to make this very clear, I understand that you need a variety of creative industries and sectors and a variety of levels. It's not okay as a member of parliament or government officials to, to just concentrate on the high end and think that's all we have to fund. The Australian Ballet School. <laughs> we have to be investing in the community because they are the foundation for the growth of emerging artists that links with the community and that those tentacles to empathy and innovation. We need all different layers. Barbara, I think you described it as an ecosystem, and that is precisely what it is. I think that's a very um, important way, a description of, um, of the sector. I'm, I might leave it there, because I think we, I'd really like to get into some questions. But I hope that gives you a sense of my commitment to the arts community, why I think it's important, and why uh, we need to work together as much as anything uh, to ensure that we start to lift the value of the way arts and creative industries are viewed in this country, ensure that we don't just dismiss it as not being part of the economic story. Actually, I think it really is part of the new economy. But more than that, you can't put a price on community and empathy. And that is why the arts are so vital.